Alright, with this section on carbohydrates now covered, I want to consider how energy is produced in the mitochondria. To do so, I want to briefly recap what we've covered in our metabolic map thus far, as the section we are about to begin picks up right where we left. So, everything started with glucose, and depending on the needs of the cell, we saw that glucose can be used in both anabolic and catabolic reactions. If there is a need for energy, glucose can undergo glycolysis and be degraded into two molecules of pyruvate. This process allowed to generate two ATPs and two NADH molecules per glucose. Importantly with glycolysis, it requires a fresh supply of NAD plus to keep the pathway going, so to replenish the supply, we covered homolactic fermentation, which takes pyruvate and converts it to lactate to get back some NAD plus. Besides glucose, other common 6-carbon sugars such as fructose, galactose, and mannose were able to get integrated into glycolysis to make some energy. On the anabolic side of things, we covered gluconeogenesis, which is a pathway that requires an input of energy and a starting material like pyruvate to reform some glucose. In the body, we mentioned a couple of times that this pathway is only performed by anabolic tissue, such as the liver, to provide glucose for the rest of the body. Nonetheless, when glucose is plentiful in cells, it can be stored in a large molecule called glycogen, which essentially is a tree of glucose molecules. If ever the cell needs some glucose back, it can break down the glycogen to obtain some. As a whole, this summarizes what we've seen in the last section. Now, although the two ATPs produced by glycolysis can supply the energy demand for some types of cells in the body, it turns out that the amount of energy produced from one molecule of glucose can be greatly increased in the mitochondrion and that is super important to consider for tissues that demand a lot of energy. So, to establish some terminology and intuition on the section we are about to cover, I want to consider a small overview of the pathways we will see. For the moment, all the reactions that we have covered occurred in the cytosol. With respect to glucose, the entry point in the mitochondrion begins with pyruvate, which can be imported into the organelle by a specific transporter. Inside the mitochondrion, the two molecules of pyruvate get converted to two molecules of acetyl-CoA, and this produces one CO2 and one NADH per pyruvate. So, from the perspective of glucose, two CO2 and two NADH. This newly made acetyl-CoA can then be further degraded in the pathway called the citric acid cycle. As its name implies, the citric acid cycle is a cycle, and one complete turn of this pathway is fueled by one acetyl-CoA. Each turn produces 3 NADH, 1 FADH2, 2 CO2, and 1 molecule of GTP. So again, if we consider the perspective of glucose, all those values will be doubled for two acetyl-CoAs. To understand what happens next, I want to mention that, as of yet, all the energy that we have produced from glucose, mostly from glycolysis, came directly as the result of a reaction. However, this is not how energy is produced in the mitochondrion. Instead, this organelle is equipped with very specific machinery that is able to synthesize ATP. This machinery is divided in two parts. The first is called the electron transport chain, and the second is called ATP synthase. Both of these components are located on the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, and work together to make ATP. We will obviously get into the details of this process later, but basically, the gist of this process is that the electron transport chain uses the many molecules of NADH and FADH2 that were produced throughout the oxidation of glucose to pump protons in between the two membranes. Then, these protons dissipate back into the mitochondrion and fuel ATP synthase to produce ATP from ADP and phosphate. In general, Although the values can change for reasons that we will discuss later, one molecule of glucose through this process is able to generate about 28 molecules of ATP, and when we combine it with the citric acid cycle and glycolysis, one molecule of glucose produces 32 ATPs. An important element of this entire process is that for the electron transport chain to function properly, it requires the presence of oxygen. Because of this dependence on oxygen to make energy, this process of producing ATP, which is also known as oxidative phosphorylation, is referred to as an aerobic process. Recall that in our discussion about glucose, homolactic fermentation was considered an anaerobic way to make energy since it did not require oxygen. A very common example of a tissue that alternates between these two methods of energy production is the muscle. Obviously, 
Oxidative phosphorylation produces more energy per amount of glucose, but this process is relatively slow and sometimes lacks the appropriate amount of oxygen, so the muscle will opt for the faster anaerobic way. Now, before we jump into the different reactions of these pathways inside the mitochondria, I want to add a few comments on the citric acid cycle. As you can see, with respect to energy making, the purpose of this cycle is to produce many molecules of NADH and FADH2, and those are the molecules that contribute the most to energy production. However, a common mistake that people make, which I did as well, is to view the citric acid cycle as a catabolic pathway or, or in other words, a continuation of glycolysis. I believe this mostly occurs because the cycle is typically taught right after glycolysis, so it kind of gives the impression that it's just a continuation, but the citric acid cycle is much more than that. Beyond being able to degrade glucose, the citric acid cycle is also a place where other macronutrients such as fatty acids and amino acids can get degraded to make energy. This is because the degradation products of all these nutrients end up producing either acetyl-CoA or pyruvate. In addition to degradation, the citric acid cycle is also a very common starting point for anabolic reactions. As we've seen in our gluconeogenesis discussion, it is oxaloacetate that begins the process to reform glucose, and as we will see later, citrate is the starting point to reform fatty acids. So, the main takeaway that I want you to get from this is that although we will cover how the citric acid cycle contributes to energy making, do not make the mistake to see it as a continuation of glycolysis. You should see this cycle as a launch pad for many other pathways, both catabolic and anabolic, and involving many different nutrients, including glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. All right, with this overview now complete, we are ready to discuss the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA and how the acetyl CoA is processed in the citric acid cycle. While covering these reactions, we will also consider the regulation surrounding these pathways. So, to begin our discussion, I want to pick up right where we left with pyruvate made after glycolysis and see how it gets converted to acetyl CoA in the mitochondrion. The first step for this to happen is to transport the pyruvate into the mitochondrion. As you can see, the mitochondrion has two membranes, an outer and inner membrane, which creates an intermembrane space between them. To cross the outer membrane, pyruvate first goes through the voltage-dependent anion channel, or simply VDAC. This ion channel has a large pore and is relatively non-specific, and as such, it basically acts as a hole in the mitochondria. Now, to cross the inner membrane, pyruvate goes through the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier along with a hydrogen ion. When the pyruvate is in, this is where it can get converted to acetyl-CoA in a pretty elaborate reaction sequence catalyzed by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, or simply PDC. When it comes to the enzymes that we'll cover in this video, the PDC is definitely one of the most interesting ones, as it operates as a multi-enzyme complex. If we take a look at the cryo-electron microscopy reconstruction of the PDC in E. coli bacteria, you can see its multiple subunits all covalently bound together. There are three types of subunits that can be found in this protein, E1, E2, and E3, and there are multiple copies of each that together make up the PDC. The reason why cells evolved to have the PDC be a multi-enzyme complex over having E1, E2, and E3 be separate proteins has everything to do with efficiency. We won't go into the details in our discussion, but the idea is that having all the subunits bunched up together reduces the side reactions and drastically increases the chances that the successive steps happen efficiently. Now, as I said, the image here is of a bacterial protein, but it turns out that the human version of the PDC is even more complicated than that one. Nonetheless, the reactions that the human PDC catalyzes are very similar and still end up converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Before we start going over the reactions, I want to quickly point out that since glycolysis produces two molecules of pyruvate, all of these reactions that we will cover will be doubled such that at the end, we can get the full yield for one glucose. So, if we start with E1, which is also called pyruvate dehydrogenase, this subunit performs the rate-limiting step of this pathway and replaces the CO2 group of pyruvate by thiamine pyrophosphate. As you can see, thiamine pyrophosphate, or simply TPP, is a pretty large molecule and is attached to the E1 subunit. To make things less crowded for us, we can simply consider TPP instead of the entire molecule but keep in mind that the remainder of the pyruvate is still attached to E1. 
You will notice also that in the process of this first reaction, the remains accept a hydrogen ion and thus produce an alcohol. This is why the remains are referred to as an hydroxyethyl group. Now, after the formation of this hydroxyethyl TPP, it is transferred onto E2, also called dihydrolipoyl transacetylase. Much like E1 that is associated with TPP, E2 is associated with the lipoamide molecule on which the hydroxyl ethyl group is transferred. This transfer frees the TPP molecule and allows it to accept more pyruvate back at the first reaction. Here again for convenience, we'll simply consider the portion of the lipoamide that binds to our pyruvate remains and you will notice that in this reaction, the double bond on the oxygen reforms. After the transfer on lipoamide, E2 also catalyzes the production of acetyl-CoA by transferring the pyruvate remains onto coenzyme A. When we consider the structure of acetyl-CoA, you can see that it is a big molecule and for that reason it is usually abbreviated to the first bond and CoA. In terms of coenzyme A's function, the first bond highlighted in red holds a lot of energy and because of that, it allows CoA to act as a carrier molecule and facilitate the transfer of what it's bound to. You will see shortly that the first reaction of the citric acid cycle is made possible because the cleavage of CoA generates the necessary energy to supply the reaction. Now, although we have fully converted pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, you will notice that the lipoamide before and after the third reaction is not the same as there are two extra hydrogens attached to it after the CoA exchange. More specifically, we say that the lipoamide prior to receiving the hydroxyethyl TPP is in an oxidized state and when it has the two hydrogens, it is in a reduced state. If you want a more thorough explanation on the redox terminology, you can consider going back to our discussion on the principle of metabolism, but the important part here is that a reduced molecule can go back to an oxidized state if another molecule does the opposite. This is where the third subunit, E3, or dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, comes into play, as its main job is to reoxidize, or in other words, restore the lipoamide, such that it can accept a new hydroxyethyl TPP. To do so, the E3 subunit contains a disulfide group that can be reduced or oxidized, and accordingly, to reoxidize the lipoamide, the oxidized disulfides of E3 take the hydrogens off the dihydrolipoamide lipoamide and allow it to restore the initial molecule. Now, obviously, this process has simply shifted the problem on something else because E3 must also be reoxidized to allow the recycling of lipoamide. The reoxidation of E3 is carried out by the reduction of NAD plus to NADH, and this entire process is aided by the FAD group that basically acts as a conduit to transfer electrons to NAD plus. In all, this cycle of redox reactions returns the disulfide bonds into their normal state and produces NADH on the way. So, when we consider what it took to degrade two molecules of pyruvate into two molecules of acetyl-CoA, two molecules of CO2 and NADH were produced. In comparison to some of the previous pathways we have covered, this one is rather small on the surface, as there are only a few reactions, but the step of converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is highly regulated in the cell. An important reason for this regulation is because this reaction is the only way in the human body to convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and as we saw in the overview of this section, acetyl-CoA is what kicks off the citric acid cycle to eventually make a ton of energy via oxidative phosphorylation. In addition to that, we will see later that in conditions of high energy, acetyl-CoA can be used to start the synthesis of fatty acids. So, because of this central role that acetyl-CoA plays in linking the degradation of carbohydrates to energy in synthesizing fat, it's crucial for the cell to regulate the output of the PDC. Accordingly, let's consider how this happens now. In a similar fashion to the other pathways we have covered, the PDC gets regulated by a mix of allosteric and covalent mechanisms. Recall that allosteric mechanisms happens when substrates bind to a given enzyme and alter its activity, and covalent mechanisms are reversible changes made on the enzyme that also impact how it functions. If we first consider the allosteric control, the PDC gets regulated by the feedback inhibition of NADH and acetyl-CoA. When they accumulate, NADH competes with NAD+, and ends up inhibiting E3, whereas accumulation of acetyl-CoA competes with CoA and ends up inhibiting E2. Although the two substrates inhibit different subunits, both regulation mechanisms follow the same logic. Indeed, high levels of NADH and acetyl-CoA 
are both indicators of energy surplus since they are both used to generate energy. As such, when they accumulate, it makes sense that they contribute to shutting down the PDC because they signal that there is enough energy in the cell and the pyruvate should not be wasted away to make acetyl-CoA. Now, the rest of the regulation happens at the level of the first reaction, which, as I pointed out, is the only irreversible reaction of this pathway. If you recall what we mentioned on substrate cycles, steps that are irreversible are great points of regulation because they control the rate at which the pathway flows. In the case of this reaction catalyzed by E1, the reaction is irreversible because when TPP swaps out the CO2, the CO2 diffuses out the mitochondria and that renders the reversible reaction impossible to happen. Because of that, E1 mediates the rate limiting step of this pathway. The main mechanism to regulate this reaction is through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation performed by the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase and the pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphatase respectively. As a quick reminder of kinases and phosphatases, the two are a class of enzymes that mediate covalent modifications. Kinases phosphorylate substrates and phosphatases remove the phosphate group. The important thing to keep in mind with these proteins is that a phosphorylation and a dephosphorylation can both inhibit or stimulate a protein. Everything depends on the context. Here, the phosphorylation mediated by the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase on E1 inhibits the enzyme. Accordingly, the dephosphorylation mediated by the phosphatase stimulates the enzyme. Obviously, if these two proteins were always to be active, there would be no net benefit on the PDC because their actions would cancel out. Because of that, these two proteins also get regulated to have one dominant depending on the context. If we first consider the kinase, it gets inhibited by pyruvate and ADP. This should make sense because if pyruvate accumulates, then it means that a lot of glucose was processed and the cell wants energy. Likewise for ADP, its accumulation signals that there are low amounts of energy in the cell, so by inhibiting the kinase, it stimulates the PDC. In terms of stimulators, NADH and acetyl-CoA both stimulate the kinase. As I said, these two substrates are signals of high levels of energy when they accumulate, so it makes sense that they would promote the inhibition of E1 in addition to already having effects on E2 and E3. In addition to all these signals, another important regulator is calcium, which turns out has dual effects on both the kinase and the phosphatase. Indeed, calcium is known to inhibit the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase and activate the phosphatase. This regulation is very important in a tissue like the muscle because calcium is also a crucial signal for muscle contraction. As such, during muscle contraction, calcium levels increase, cause the net stimulation of the PDC and generate acetyl-CoA that will be used to make energy and fuel the ongoing contractions. The last element of regulation that I want to mention relates to the hormonal control of this process. Throughout this discussion, we have considered the impacts of epinephrine, glucagon, and insulin on the metabolism of glucose. It turns out that epinephrine and glucagon have no direct impacts on this pathway, but insulin does. We are not going to cover the enzymatic cascades that cause the effects, but the bottom line is that insulin stimulates the activity of the phosphatase and thus the synthesis of acetyl-CoA. To broadly define the purpose of insulin, we have mentioned a couple of times that this hormone promotes the removal of glucose from the blood. In this context, one way to interpret the effects of insulin is that promoting this reaction is a way to stimulate the consumption of glucose, which will entice the cells to get more from the blood. This regulation might be of even more relevance in cells that convert glucose to fat, as the production of acetyl-CoA from glucose can be used to synthesize fatty acids. With this being said, this concludes our discussion on the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and its regulation, which means that we can move on to the citric acid cycle. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.